the final night of the 16th Time of the Writer Festival, themed Writing a New World, hosted by the Center for Creative Arts, University of KwaZulu-Natal. My name is Nisha Naidu, and I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge all UKZN Executive Committee members, DVCs and heads of schools, deans, student representative body members, as well as any city officials present. And just to cover myself so that I'm not accused of being elitist, imperialist, sub-imperialist, uh. neoliberalist, technicist, or any other terminology that I might have missed Andile and Ashwin, <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us on this long weekend weekend. And thank you for coming out for the whole week and making this time of the writer it's very, very special. And really, to cover my bases, thank you to all the wonderful writers. You've really given us a really fabulous program. We've had passion, we've had drama, we've had excitement, we've had intrigue, accusations, counter-accusations, denunciations, debunking, demystifying, deconstruction, and that was all on the first day trying to seat you at the media launch. So the rest of the week's program has been equally exciting. And to continue, I would like to invite our first panel up on stage. That is Ashwin Desai and Johnny Steinberg to talk about writing the other, facilitated by Frederico Settler. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody to this evening's uh, session, the first session of this evening, uh, that is uh, concerned with uh, writing the other. Uh, my name is Federico Settler. I'm a faculty member at the University of KwaZulu Natal, attached to the School of Religion, Philosophy, and Classics. Uh, I'd like to say a special welcome to our two panelists for this evening, Ashwin Desai and Johnny Steinberg, who probably need uh, no introduction. Uh, particularly, they've been active for much of this week. Um, they are both uh, commentators on social histories and have written extensively on social issues and social movements in South Africa for quite an extended period. Uh, they've both published, uh, Johnny, you've, you've published uh, Midlands, The Numbers, and The Three-Letter uh, three, three Plague, and more recently, Little Liberia, uh, which is an African odyssey in New York, which is one of the book that we'll be particularly looking at this evening. Uh, Ashwin, you have written quite a lot of material around social, social movements or social histories, uh, particularly in KwaZulu Natal. Um, we're looking, and I particularly recall uh, We Are the Poors, The Poors of Chatsworth, uh, your 2010 book on race to transformation, and more recently, uh, in the book that we'll be looking at this evening, which is uh, Writing Revolution Shakespeare on Robben Island. And under, under this, for this evening's discussion, we'll be focusing particularly on this notion of the writing the other and what that involves. Because both these writers in their recent publications have spent extended periods um, of nearly up to two years with various constituencies. I know Johnny spent some time in New York with a, a very small Liberian community of exiles that have uh, settled in New York over kind of period between the sort of mid 80s through to the 19, early 1990s. And Ashwin, you have uh, spent time inspired by uh, the great Sonny Van Cut thread, <laughs> uh, and 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 his kind of uh, kind of his volume on the complete works of Shakespeare and that how ins that inspired you to look at how political prisoners incarcerated on Robben Island uh, sought to articulate and write against the grain uh, and make sense of their experience both as incarcerated prisons but also reflect critically on uh, South Africa at large. So this is what we sort of will be looking at this evening. But uh, these two are also both, as, apart from being social commentators, Johnny is currently uh, attached to the Center for African Studies at the University of Oxford. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and most recently, Johnny uh, was nominated and received the uh, Wyndham Campbell Prize for Literature from Yale for his contribution to literature. And, uh, 
Ash Ashwin is an associate professor of sociology at the University of Johannesburg, um, where he, we spoke a little bit this afternoon, he informed me of all the, the challenges of, <laughs> of engaging sociologically with, with issues within South Africa. Um, but the two books, uh, some of you might be familiar with these, uh, some of you might not, so I'll just give you a brief introduction before I go on to the sort of order of business for this evening. Um, in Ashwin's book, Writing the Revolution, he offers an intimate portrayal of the lives of uh, the incarcerated prisoners, um, that were in prisoners rather, that were incarcerated on uh, Robben Island over a period, I, I'd say, probably about 40, 45 years. Um, but it's not simply a portrayal of, of kind of life. He also offers a revisionist history using uh, the complete works of Shakespeare and the way in which the incarcerated prisoners engaged with this as a way of making sense not only of their condition on the island, but also how they reflected critically on the text and what it meant for their lives in South Africa. And, and this, of course, you, you will understand and know very well that these were under very severe conditions where, where these prisoners weren't allowed any kind of text. They weren't allowed to just, uh, there was a lot of very bizarre and strained restrictions on the kinds of texts that prisoners were allowed. And so Ashwin offers um, this perspective on rereading the narrative of Robben Islands and the experience of incarceration um, from the perspective of these prisoners. And I look forward to asking you some more questions about this a little later on. Uh, Johnny's most recent work, uh, Little Liberia, offers a moving and at times disturbing perspective on the lives of two uh, Liberian uh, refugees, uh, the migrants, I'm not quite, no, actually, yeah, migrants, <laughs> but uh, in, in, the, in the text uh, there's a kind of all kind of terms being used, but they, they settle in New York eventually during a time after a time of turmoil and displacement from Liberia between the late 80s and the early 1990s. But the book introduces us to not only issues of migration, displacement, but a sense of uh, politics of identity, trying to make sense of location, um, and, and also wrestling with questions of modernity, being both from Liberia, having experienced trauma, and trying to make sense and retain a connectedness with their sort of countries of origin. So then it's against this backdrop that these two key figures, Rufus and Jacob, uh, seek to make meaning not only of their trauma and displacement, but also seek to make meaningful sense of both kind of mobility um, and of connection to, to Liberia and more. But, you know, we'll have at least 45 minutes to, to hear more about that. But that's a kind of brief introduction. But in terms of thinking about how we write about the other, uh, as a post-colonial scholar, I understand my own understanding of the other is generally, and, and I've heard a number of discussions over the last sort of, uh, sort of I think, 36 hours that I've been part of, uh, this, this, this wonderful gathering, was being questions about who can speak on behalf of whom, and you know, who's entitled to do what. And so this evening, I hope we'll have an opportunity to inter interrogate at least two of these writers to begin to really get to s some of the sort of key issues around this. But in post-colonial theory and historically, the idea of the other has been discussed in relation to the European center and the colonial margins. And the European Center has been seen as this kind of sexually disciplined, coherent, cognitive, um, s sexually disciplined and Christian kind of, uh, 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 kind of, kind of uh, entity or kind of group of people. And, and the inverse of that being the superstitious, the lazy, um, and often kind of uh, um, like uh, oversexed kind of African or Asian, you know, and variously represented. As, um, are you waving over there? You're like echoes of yourself. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then, and variously, Africans and Asians have been, or persons of color, have been variously represented as either exotic or savage. But I mean, tonight I hope we will have the opportunity to move beyond those kinds of categories because both of these writers are engaging with the other as, as authors. I think as, as like you've worked with incarcerated prisoners, a very particular constituency, and Johnny, you have worked with uh, and have written, you both have written, Johnny, you've written about Liberians trying to make sense of life and being in New York. So I hope that you know, you'll be able to share with us some of these kind of challenges of doing this kind of work and the challenges of writing 
the other. Um, that's not going to be necessarily much about you. I'm not here to necessarily engage, <laughs> interrogate you and your own sort of, your or your, uh, your, the people you wrote about subjectivities. But before we start, I want to invite each of the writers to uh, read a short piece. Uh, I know, Johnny, you've elected this evening to read a piece from something that you're working on currently. Um, and Ashwin, you've elected to read something of your own reflections. So these are not necessarily readings from the two pieces under consideration for this evening. And then thereafter, I will have some questions uh, for discussion, just to kind of get us going, uh, at which point I will open the floor for further discussions from the audience. And uh, then, as you know, I will have hopefully some more questions at the end, if the audience permits. So uh, without uh, taking more time, um, we're going to start with Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, Rico. Um, no, I'm, I'm sometimes asked what, what's the difference between my work and fiction, and, and, and the main difference is that I don't have license to get into somebody else's head. I can only know what I know. But to write about somebody, I do need to know quite a lot about their internal world. Uh, that means getting to know them very, very well and getting them to share stuff with me that they wouldn't ordinarily share. Um, and that poses a whole range of questions, and one of them is compensation. You take up somebody's time, and a lot of time, over a period of maybe two years. Um, and for me, that presents a conundrum that I, I don't know how to solve. I don't think there's an ethically good way to solve this. I, I think paying a very poor person to reveal an intimate part of themselves is, is tough, but not paying them is also tough. And in the book that I'm just finished writing now, published early next year, about a, a young Somali man in South Africa, I mean, when I met him, he was hustling for a living. He, he literally couldn't afford to talk to me. So, so I'm, I'm going to read from the beginning of the book, and it's about that issue. Okay. Asad Abdullah sits opposite me at a table in the company gardens. Around us, elderly white men are playing chess. My notebook is open on the table, my pen in my hand. I'm asking Assad about the Quran district in Mogadishu, where he spent the first eight or so years of his life. He says he remembers so little. It doesn't matter, I say. Instead of trying to remember, just tell me what comes into your head when you think of Mogadishu. The oddest thought comes to me. He is wearing a body-hugging yellow hoodie and, thin, and, and skinny blue jeans. And in this tight attire, he seems not just tall and thin, but elongated. Each part of him, his nose, his cheeks, his palms and his fingers, his torso, appear to have been ever so caringly stretched. The result is elegant. It occurs to me that he is sitting in Cape at Cape Town's point of origin. The gardens around us were planted 358 years ago, almost to the day. Here is Assad on very old ground, while he himself is so new and so decidedly unwelcome. In his slender fingers is a twig. I think he picked it up while we strolled up from the library. Now he snaps it in half and draws it to his nose. His eyebrows rise with surprise. He smells it again. Amazing, he said. From the moment I saw it on the ground, I knew what the smell would remind me of. And he begins to tell me of how he made ink. He was six years old at a madrasa, preparing the charcoal mixture into which he would dip his pen in order to copy out the Quran. To bind the ink, he says, you need the sap of an agrig tree. You snap open a branch and with pinched fingers tease out the juice. While stirring the mixture, you absentmindedly put your fingers to your nose. You breathe in deeply. Ah. The smile on his face is wistful and intense, and I think I have an inkling of where he has gone. He knows that I'm still here, and at the table next to us, men are playing chess, but he is also elsewhere, and he's savoring it, for he understands that it can only last a few seconds. He has reeled back more than 20 years. With the twig he has found in the company gardens, he is reliving a forgotten high. I feel a whim rising. I know that if I think about it, even for a moment, I will find a reason to back off. So I do not think about it. A man who idly snaps open a twig and is transported back into his childhood madrasa is a man about whom I ought to write a book. There and then, I tell him that I'll give him 7,000 rand to start his business. I'm going to skip a bit. I give him 7,000 rand, and he starts his business, and I go and see him several times. And after a while, I tell him I want to write a book about him, and that I'll give him... 25% of the royalties, and ask him to think about it. Um, and I'll read on. I'd thought that the 7,000 would free him to talk to me. After all, one can hardly ask a man who scrounges daily for work to take off two days a week to sift through his memories. 
but his new shop brings to our meetings troubles of a different ilk. His wife can work the counter while he speaks to me, but she knows little English and no Osa or Afrikaans, and so Assad, increasingly adept at all three, must be on hand. Sometimes I accompany him to Mitchell's Plain Town Center or to Belleville, or to a chore he must do in the center of town, but on the whole we must conduct our interviews in shouting distance of his business. At first we meet in his shack. I sit on the edge of his bed and he on a plastic chair, but from the start he is uncomfortable with the arrangement. He fiddles incessantly with his hands. At the slightest sound outside, he cocks his head and listens. An hour into our, into our second interview, he has had enough. He tells me briskly that we cannot meet in his shack any longer and insists that we move to my car. And so day after day, that is where we meet. I sit in the driver's seat, he in the passenger seat, my notebook passing between us as I record his testimony in shorthand and he draws pictures of the scenes he describes. My car is parked parallel to his shack, no more than a meter or two from the mesh-covered hole through which his wife serves his customers. Each person who comes to buy from him brushes against our car door. He tells me that he wants it this way because his shack is too small, but it isn't. It's a perfectly comfortable space in which to talk, far more convivial, in fact, than a car. I wonder what his real reasons are and why he wishes to keep them concealed. It comes to me slowly and in increments as our time together stretches into a rhythm and as the rhythm begins to emit meaning. More bluntly, it comes to me once I imbibe the bizarreness and the perversity of our meetings. Generally, I leave for Blickistorp from my office at the university. <coughs> the guard raises the boom and I drive onto the M3 motorway. All this while, I'm a, I'm a citizen of my country and the many strangers around me know this. One of them might choose to shoot a bullet into my head, but he knows that a machinery will kick into motion and people will come looking for him. I and the people around me are in orbit together. We are all aware of the rules. Assad does not move within this orbit. He stands outside of it, for the rules do not apply to him. His shop fills with cash every day, and he knows that his neighbors know that were somebody to shoot him in the head and take his money, the machinery of state would stutter reflexively into motion and then grind to a halt. I come to see that this knowledge shapes his life. In his every decision, from the largest to the smallest, the imperative to be free tussles with the imperative to be safe. On his shoulders rests the incessant burden of dodging his own murder. I am slow to understand. I see that this shapes every aspect of his life but one, his relationship with me. It dawns on me only during our third week together. We're sitting in my car, talking. Turn on the ignition, he says. I look at him. A moment ago, he was deep in childhood memory, his head bowed, his hand running habitually over the dashboard. Now he is sitting bolt upright, and his eyes are fixed in my near, on my rearview mirror. I turn around. Don't, he says, just start the ignition. I obey. Then I adjust my side mirror to see what he sees. A couple of hundred meters back, three young men, their hoodies low over their eyebrows, are walking towards us. I'm not afraid. I'm certain that they will soon turn left or right and head down another street. They are simply three blicky store residents going about their business. After all, everyone under a certain age wears a hoodie. Assad's lies neatly fold among the clothes in his shack. We wait. I begin to feel Assad's fear, as if it is a virus, as if it has jumped off him and sank into my skin and is now coursing through my veins. This moment is so very productive. While a part of him is in my blood, I can understand. I can know why he insists on meeting in my car. More important, I know the calculations he has made when he allowed me into his life. You get scared every time I visit, I say. Yes, he replies, his eyes still fixed on the men behind us. You worry that a white man in a good car attracts men with guns, that you and your family are much more unsafe when I am around. I worry about that so much, he says. You insist that we meet in the mornings because that is when gangsters sleep. That's right. And you want to meet in the car so that you can see danger coming. In the shack, he replies, you can see nothing. The first you see of them is the gun in your face. By now, the three young men have walked right past us, and we are watching their backs as they disappear. I turn off the engine and pick up my pen and notebook. I do not want to tell him what else I think I now know. Saying it aloud would be dangerous, would force us to examine our arrangements in its naked perversity, would make it hard for us to continue. I'm imagining the calculations he has made. He very much wants to hang on to me, for I'm a person from the other side, a person who travels within the orbit of law. Who knows when he may need such a person to come to his aid, perhaps tonight for all he is aware. But to keep our acquaintance, he must sit for hours alongside me and remember his past. Otherwise, I will soon vanish from his life. And he must do this remembering in the vicinity of his home and family, 
for he cannot wander from his new business so often and for so long. Yet the routine of my recurring presence, he believes, is bound to attract men with guns. And so he draggles. He draws close to the parts of me that bring safety while diluting as best he can the parts that bring danger. Hence my car. Between October 2010 and September 2011, we spend many hours there. While his internal eye peers into his childhood, the eyes on either side of his nose scan the streets. Um, what I thought I'll read is uh, something that a few people in the audience might be familiar with. It's uh, based around uh, the great marches we had in the city um, when Afghanistan and then Iraq were about to be invaded. And uh, um, a lot of you people who are here today were participating in that. And it's uh, a story about how we tried to build this coalition amongst various groups in the city. Um, after 9-11, the U.S. was on the rampage. Afghanistan and Iraq were all on the radar screen. Whether they liked it or not, the Arab world was going to be bombed into Western civilization. Protests across the world sought to confront this new form of imperialism, as it was labeled. In Durban, we were suitably outraged. Meetings were held in the Anjuman School Hall in the city center. Molanas with their long beards sat with white feminists from the university with short skirts. Coalitions are always uncomfortable. Many Molanas knew only life in the madrasa. There, the congregants were men, and their wives knew their place. Confronted with women's voices, they seemed to lose theirs. We did what all protests do, planned a march. There were many log logistical things to discuss, the route, the funding, marshalling, city hall permission, medical support, and the content of the memorandum. Suddenly, in chorus, the Molanas formed their voices. Where would the women march? <laughs> On their own, the beards insisted. No way the short skirts from the faculty responded. <laughs> Finally, a compromise was reached. Muslim women would march separately from men. Women non-believers could march anywhere they wanted. <laughs> we snaked, more like a puff adder than a python, down Smith's, the then Smith Street, and left towards the British consulate. It was quite a sight. Semi-naked women, alongside over men, leading mass women corralled into a section, kept pies in place by ropes. The consulate was a tight squeeze. It had been built to host cocktail parties, not delegations. We squeezed in the first ranks. A representative in a nice cotton suit came down to meet the marchers. A Molana on a megaphone charged against Blair, he is a homosexual. <laughs> the feminists led by a Norwegian blonde were outraged. Someone took the tension away shouting, I'm a homosexual too, but I fuck in my, but I fuck in my own house, unlike Blair who's fucking the Muslims. <laughs> now the Molanas were getting pissed off. We quickly gave the memorandum, all marches must have memos, and made for the US consulate, the real devil. Fatima Mir waded through the barriers and had a microphone shoved in her hand. A long memo was pushed into the other one. A consular official came forward to receive the memo. Fatima, without looking up, began reading. It was full with all kinds of invective about white imperialists and the renewed racism. The U.S. consular was black. It was getting embarrassing. <laughs> I grabbed the microphone from her. A Plains Coast policeman grabbed it back. I threatened him with a theft as it was my microphone. He gave it back to me. I called the consular house nigger, tried to throw some red cutex on me, but he had been slightly hardened and I could not get it out of the bottle. <laughs> he did not wait for me as I vigorously shook the bottle up and down, clutched my right hand. Wanker, he sneered as he turned on his heels behind the police cordon. We retreated. But those behind the barbed wire wanted some more action. With crumple memo in hand, we made our way to smash up the McDonald's. <laughs> Fatima Mir was confused. She told her confidant that Ashwin, you cannot trust him. He can turn on you at any time. <laughs> the whites led by the beautiful Norwegian were very unhappy. By using the words house nigger, I had displayed a gross racism. They were pulling out of the coalition. The Molanas were unhappy because they had no idea they were marching not only with short skirts, but also with homosexuals. <laughs> some of the homosexuals were possibly even wearing some of the short skirts. <laughs> 
In fact, I'd seen one of the undermarried Molanas and praising one earlier. Marches can be such a drag. <laughs> it got worse. The social movements were disgusted because they felt the local issues like electricity cutoffs were not raised in the march against the Americans and that they were manipulated into coming. <laughs> Among the academics aligned to various social movements, disagreement broke out. Who were the real representatives of the poorest of the poorly poor, the shack dwellers and those merely casually indigent, the brick and mortar flat dwellers in Sydenham Heights who were labeled the shelter aristocracy? Or were Fanon's truly wretched, the victims of xenophobia evicted even from the squatter camps? Rosa Luxemburg Foundation grants dependent on the outcome of these differentiating factors as contending academics went to the research grant market. <laughs> the weather was stifling. Fatima Mir, praise her soul, had a stroke. Molana Shah, who sang the most beautiful songs from the protest truck and railed against the Zionists, joined the Democratic Alliance. <laughs> the leading Norwegian feminist married a local from Overport, the son of a Hindu priest, and became a good wife. <laughs> she chants at the temple in the neighborhood. Halima and Furpaza, with sparkling eyes, who manned the 24th picket outside U.S. consulate, has moved her dress. She has changed her wardrobe, dumping the parda for a new part in the left front. They contain a group of reconstructed Stalins and Trotskyites, but are made up for this by adding the word democratic somewhere in that name. <laughs> I forgot where. I bumped into Comrade Halima in a meeting of climate justice activists. She passed me a copy of What is to be Done, the Quran of Left Truths. The social movements had gone on speaking to us in Europe, all that is left of them. They, they were hosted. I'll just move on. Oops. Where's my page? It's the CIA again. <laughs> they were hosted by their various academic sponsors in between quick visits home to, the oppressed by the, to be oppressed by the ANC. The coalition of the unwilling, as we were labeled, had walked their own ways. In my time, I have supported every other in Durban. The Bushmen of Wentworth against the coloreds of Greenwood Park. <laughs> the coolies of Unit 3 Temple against the Mountagecombe Brahmins. <laughs> the South Indians against the North Indians. The shack dwellers of Banana City against those with real houses in Varsity Drive. The women of Amlazi wearing pants were taken off mine in the taxi rank knockout. Now I'm marching down West Street. Now I was marching down West Street screaming, I am a Muslim. <laughs> Me, whiskey swilling, pork eating, wannabe Englishman. I could have been Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, although my sexual appetites and imaginations are more like Gandhi's. <laughs> I still have some way to go. In my next life, I'm going to be a transvestite. A man with no legs, an intruder, a Palestinian Jew, who knows? A altar boy in the Catholic Church. Oh, there's so many others I still have to be. What have we introduced to? The great struggles of the centuries that have had slave revolts and wooden knee. What have we reduced to? Identity and representation, the entrepreneurs reduced to biographical solutions to systemic contradictions. Thank you. Well, thank you to you both for... By the way, Federico, what a surname. Thank God the PAC didn't come to power. You'd be in deep trouble. Settler. <laughs> yes. Settler. <laughs> yeah, I have imperialist thinking. <laughs> Anyway, on that note, uh, thank you very much for, well, for both your pieces. I uh, look forward to actually seeing these uh, in its full kind of, you know, volumes published and completed. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. Someday. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as, as you both, from, from your text, clearly comes out this issue that we've under, is under consideration this evening, this question of sort of writing the other. So I suppose one of the opening questions that I should ask, but what I like, would like to do this evening is pose to... Uh, our two authors this evening, three sort of related questions around the other, and you have the freedom to address any one of those, because, we, you know, we have limited time, and so instead of going through them sequentially, you just pick whichever one you feel most appropriate re relates to uh, what, what, you know, your own reflections. 
So I suppose the first one is how do you understand the other? You both engage uh, with communities that are very different to you and communities in your case that you're clearly quite intimately familiar with, uh, Ashwin, as in your case, but how do you understand the other in your writing? Or how do you raise the subaltern voice, you know, the subaltern as the other of the dominant discourse? So that's like the first question. The second question is, much of post-colonial thinking have come to assert that the encounter between the dominant uh, and the subject or the, the dominant and the marginal, that both identities are inevitably unstable, as you've both sort of sought to sort of suggest in, in your reading so far, and are often disrupted. So how do you capture that disruption, instability, or fracture in your writing between the other and the dominant, or between the other and the self. Because, uh, for example, Johnny, in your book, uh, Little Liberia, there's a moment in the early parts, around sort of page 23, you say that about Jacob, I think, so on this character, similarly like you've just said about Assad, and the sort of calculations that he engages in, in terms of making sense of his environment. You talk also about, uh, I think it's Jacob, the other character in Little Liberia, that every moment in his 20-hour days was clearly a move in a very long game, Johnny writes, and he goes on to say, I, whether he is insane or formidably calculating, I do not yet have a clue. And then you're going to say that, you know, but I want to find out. So I just kind of, you know, clearly there's a sense of like, you recognize the agency and the perspective in which people engage. Ashwin, you do something similar in the beginning of your, 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 your text on Robben Island, when you invoke this kind of Fanonian caution about reading European text. Uh, where Fanon suggests that, you know, when we do this kind of reading of European text, we should be cautious that we don't simply become sort of copies, but we become caricatures. And then you ask the question, yes, well, you know, Fanon offers this caution, but really is it maybe a deliberate strategy of reading against the grain? So those are the kind of, kind of the sort of second question. And the last issue is how do you understand the subject communities in terms of how they activate of their agency? How do they assert themselves against the dominant paradigm? You know, and, 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 and how do you capture this within your text, within your writing? I know there's quite a lot to sort of in there, but take your pick. It's like licorice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, I, 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 I wouldn't presume to give voice to the other. I think that's, um, that uh, perhaps what I'd do is something a little different. Um, I mean, I can only really give voice to myself, really. I, I can know what I know. Um, but I, and I, I guess what I do is get to know somebody's relationship with me very well and write about that. And, and uh, in certain contexts, that can speak to uh, the country or the world. So, for instance, in, in, in my book, Three Letter Plague, I went off to the middle of an, an, uh, an ARV program in the trans guy. Um, got to know a young man very well. Um, and I'm white and privileged, and his relationship to me tells you a great deal if you want to use the word the other about the relation to the other and the dominant. Um, so, for instance, at, at one point, um, I want to use his real name, and he says no. Uh, and, and the reason is that he's ashamed of his relationship with me. And he's ashamed because he says that in telling me about himself, I've shared a black person's secrets with a white person. I've shared something which is not just his interior, but something communal. Um, and that was an enormously insightful moment for me, to understand that shame and embarrassment of having said things to me as a white person. Um, I mean, it got me to understand the role of shame and guilt in his life generally, and, 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 and therefore what AIDS meant to him. So I'd, I, I can't give voice to another person, but I can try and understand somebody's relationship to me. Um, and what's most productive is the uncomfortable and conflictual relationship to me. Um, and, and that can begin speaking to the world. That can begin speaking about race and about class and about um, the interior of another person, even though I haven't been into that interior. <laughs> Pick up there, or yeah. you know, to respond well, to you know, I mean, uh, two things: you can't, uh, you know, in this city especially, you can't escape your own biography. You know, it, it marks you, it can imprison you, it can liberate you, and so on. I mean, I, but I'm lucky that you know, kind of, my own family setup allowed me to uh, be quite Machiavellian about identity. So my mother is a Christian, Catholic. My father a Gujarati, Hindu. My mother's Tamil speaking, but my surname could be. Uh, Desai could be a Muslim surname. So when I, want to, when I was really in the stage of my life when I'm trying to mobilize people by having an identity with them, 
I would just make up these things. You know, suddenly I was a Gujarati one day, next thing I was a Catholic, now I was a Tamil. You know, I was actually even adopting these identities, like, you know, and uh, because I was brought up on the streets of Durban where you, you maneuver through these identities. So, uh, you know, the, this idea of some kind, it's a strategic essentialism, right? I, and I have no problems with that. Uh, I mean, there are limits, but, you know, uh, so, so that really helps in the city uh, kind of thing. Um, but in terms of the Shakespeare thing, I, I must be honest, I, uh, you know, I, I really sometimes write things for just uh, quite uh, devious political intent. And I was trying to find a way. I mean, I, I loved Shakespeare. And, you know, for, for all the, uh, uh, the 40s and 50s, the Shakespeare that was read uh, by, by people as a liberation text was, was The Tempest, as you know. And, and the Caliban was the revolutionary figure. But as Rob Nixon brilliantly says, um, you know, that what the Tempest couldn't do was to talk about the Caliban's in power. And that what, um, what the Shakespeare lacked was the sixth act when the Caliban's come to power. And I just wanted to write a book so I could write the sixth act and show what happens when the Caliban's come to power and the actress Prospero's, and authoritarian, and so on. So, I mean, I wrote a whole book just to write one chapter. I mean, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> Nut, yeah. I'm a nutcase. I mean. Well, I mean, yes, it's, 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 that, that is the last chapter of yeah, the book. Yeah, and then yeah. I found out the ANC guys, they don't read the last chapter anyways. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'd like to respond to you both, obviously. I mean, thank, thank you. I'm glad you raised strategic essentialism and not me. Um, Johnny, I also have a question, I mean, about you, you sort of engaging with your, um, with your informant, particularly your most recent informant, and, like, as a researcher, it's kind of, you know, seven grand to your informer. I'm like, oh, you know, like, as, as an author, it's like you, you just, you negotiate this stuff, but as a sort of academic researcher, there are all kinds of questions for me around that. Um, I mean, you you very open, Ashwin, about your the deliberateness of your work, and, and yet you say that you you talked about the ANC guys. They only read up reads up to sort of you yeah. know the, the penultimate chapter. Yeah. But of course, your book, eh, when you read it, is not it's kind of it's a deliberately re written against the ANC guys. It's, it's a kind of intentionality about some of some of that text. So I wanted to just throw another question out to both of you. There's this kind of notion that in both of your texts, uh, whether it's Little Liberia or Writing Revolution or your most, more, more recent work, I mean, uh, like uh, Edward Said has a suggestion that, that no text is without ideological orientation. So, so your own ideological orientation, whether it's kind of your sort of wacky kind of, you know, son of the city or your very negotiated settlement between your and your informants, um, how do you actually negotiate that position? in relation to this matter under consideration, because whether you've negotiated or whether you feel you are an insider and therefore speak on behalf of the subaltern, like, how, how, you know, how do you, how do you resolve that for yourself? If you can maybe just speak, speak to some of that in, in your text, in your writing. Ashwin, we can start uh, you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm always open to, 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 to when I'm researching something, to really uh, starting to, uh, to take the evidence and change my mind about things and quit quite... Uh, I find that the most beautiful part because I have preconceptions, I have ideas. And then when I, when I start looking at the material um, and start to talk to people and research it, and it destroys many of the things that I came into the field with, I find that the most, I'm, I'm, I'm open to that all the time. And uh, when, I, when I did the book on, on transformation in sport, this, this really was quite an eye-opener for me because I started to understand this word transformation in a much more uh, nuanced, much more uh, uh, serious way. So uh, I had a focus on a Jaguars rugby club, which is the only black rugby club in the, at the time in the Premier League of KwaZulu Natal. And I just showed how people, when you do transformation from the top, you can completely hurt the people you're supposedly trying to help. So what happened to Jaguars is that the uh, uh, KwaZulu Natal Cricket U uh, Rugby Union made a decision that every Premier League rugby club would have three black players. And, uh, uh, and, and those clubs didn't want to go and have academies and, and train uh, black players. They just went and watched Jaguars every week and bought the black players from Jaguars. And, and so uh, eventually this started to hurt the Jaguars. And, uh, and the end result of this kind of top-down transformation 
in its narrow racial way in that kind of thing meant that eventually Jaguars get uh, relegated. And you start to think about this easy words that we have sometimes and how policymakers can make them from the top, but how they can destroy the very things they intend. So I find that kind of uh, intellectual challenge, which then feeds into my political consciousness, probably the, the best part about writing. So you're saying that part of that was a very deliberate and intentional sort of uh, interrogating a problem yeah. in society. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and you know, it's, it's, it really makes you start to think much more clearly. And unfortunately, the people who make these macro policies have no idea of the, of the consequences of their policies. They don't have to go back and, 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 and rethink them. They don't have to look at the unintended consequences. They don't have to look at the, you know, the, the real outcomes over a period of time. So, uh, you know, you can see this in, in South Africa's macroeconomic project. The, you know, I said this before, the guy who was the architect of it, uh, Trevor Manuel, uh, with gear, then returns to work in the presidency to show us in minute detail in the National Development Plan how bad things have become over the last 20 years. <laughs> but he orchestrated and he was the architect of it. This is quite incredible. It's like, you know, having a Nazi as a judge at Nuremberg. I mean, this is like a ridiculous thing. <laughs> Johnny, would you like to sort of sure. respond to that question? <laughs> well, I mean, your question is, what does one do to give the subaltern voice? I, I mean, I really wouldn't presume to give the subaltern voice. I, I'm, I'm not sure, I, I'm sure what that would mean. I mean, it's, it's, it's a book I'm, I'm writing. Uh, you know, I'm not the subaltern. Um, but what I try and do is, is over a long period of spending time with somebody, is, is really try to answer one question about that person, just one question, and that's, what does that person see when he or she, in my case, usually he, sees his death? Um, everybody is imagining their death, that we're, we're, we're mortal, and, and our sense of who we are is, 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 is imagined around the finite. Um, and everybody, no matter who they are, no matter what the circumstances of their life, has almost a built-in structure in their head um, of life narrative and, and what it would have meant when it's over. Um, and I find that if I can answer that question with some degree of authority about a person, I can write a book about them, um, and it will, it will be satisfying. It will kind of animate the life. It will tell you what decisions they've made and why. And, and this guy I'm writing about now, I mean, he had the most bizarrely deracinated life. He, he, he drifted around um, East Africa for his whole childhood, unattached to any particular adult. He had very little agency as a child. He was just kicked around like a stone. And eventually, at the age of 21, a hustler on the streets of Addis um, started making good and accumulating some money. Uh, and for the first time in his life, was able to make a decision. And his decision was to put $1,000 in his pocket and without a passport or any documents to head south and get to South Africa. Um, and it's a decision he was very, very sorry for after he got here. So good question to ask is, why did he do that? What was he imagining when he did that? Um, generally, he was imagining who he was going to be when he died. Uh, and to figure that out about somebody is to, I think, really get to their depth. Well, thank you. Sure. Wow. Um, I mean, the, the issue of, of death and bodies, yes, piece of really, really large stuff, yeah. Um, I mean, that definitely comes out in both of your texts. Um, well, I'm, I'm very drawn to it, but also as, a, as an atheist, I'm like, yeah, you know, when it's over, well, it's, it's over. Well, it's an especially <laughs> tough question for atheists, because there's nothing later. <laughs> there's nothing after for atheists. Big, yeah. big question for atheists. Anyway, yeah. but uh, since, since we're on this issue of sort of death and bodies, which is very much present in both of your texts, I have two, two last questions, one for you, Johnny, and then one for you, Ashwin. Ashwin, the question to you is, um, you know, a seasoned sort of ethnographers or social historians, both of your texts are kind of situated in the space between sort of memory and fantasy, particularly the recollections of the incarcerated on Robben Island. Like, how do you capture these tensions and uh, paradoxes? You know, because you, you're talking to people, but it's all retrospective. Yes. You know, and there's some evidence, but it's anecdotal. And how do you get to sort of a real truth? Well, does a real truth not really matter in terms of representing their experience? So that's a question to you. To Johnny, when I, when I read uh, your text, um, there was one thing that I found really, really striking in, in the text is that in terms of both your informants, there was, uh, despite the fact that the, the book opens with this startling scene of an 11 and 13 year old being raped by four Liberian boys, you know, in, in, in Staten Island, in this community, there's a, a, a sort of a silencing 
of women's experience, despite all this speaking of bodies and war and, and brutality and annihilation, there's just this kind of, kind of muting of, of gender. And I, I was wondering, how do you deal with that? Because towards the end of the book, I think there's one of uh, Rufus, he asserts that polygamy is the cause of all African conflict. And he says that jealousy is woven into the fabric of every family. Jealousy is uh, woven into the fabric of family life in Africa. And he, and he goes on to say that it's because every woman wanted the children of other wives to fail. So it's like women are at the center of the disintegration and the dysfunction. So I wanted to ask you, how do you manage the sort of apparent patriarchy and misogyny of your informants? Yeah, I mean, these are the other, and so you're raising this voice, but it's also a sometimes perverted voice. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Well, I think it's a little harsh calling Rufus a misogynist. Um, I mean, one, one could argue that men are at the roots of the problem of polygamy, but... Um, um, I mean, on the general question of, of men and women, I'm, I mean, for this book, I, I interviewed four people extensively, two men and two women. Um, and in the end, with much to my disappointment, the women didn't, um, kind of didn't fit narratively into the story. It was, it was a conflict between these two, a very, very masculine conflict between two men. Um, and, and that's what consumed the book. And I guess that to write a decent book, um, I need to try and sink into somebody else. And, and I guess it's no coincidence that I usually, um, I find it easier to do with men, because I think I'm probably imagining myself there. There's, a, there's some projection and, and imagination going on. Um, so, so yes, out of the four people, the, the, the book ended up gravitating towards the men, probably because of my strengths and weaknesses. Um, uh, one day I'll be drawn to, to writing as intimately about a woman. It didn't happen in this case. Okay. Can, can I push you a little bit on the question? I mean, perhaps misogyny is harsh, but, but how do you resolve when, when you are writing a particular kind of space and your informants are biased yeah. or, you know, they you have prejudice? I think, I think for, a, for a narrative book to work, the worst possible thing you could do is speak over your informant's head at, at your reader and sort of point at the informant and say look, they're sexist, look, they're racist, look, they're this. I think it's an absolute disaster. Any decent <laughs> reader just puts down the book and says, oh, God, you know, let, let me get onto some decent writing. Um, I, I, I think you have to suspend judgment and, and show what's going on with a person. And a reader is intelligent enough to make up their own mind. Um, and if somebody is violent, if somebody is misogynist, if somebody is a bastard, um, try and live it in the book. Try and show the guts of it. Try and show the blood in it. I mean, that's what you do as a writer. Thank you. Well, I suppose that leads very nicely into the question of how do you resolve these, the, the paradoxes about kind of, you know, memory and fantasy. Yeah. No, I think you, you're spot on. I, uh, you know, found that I was interviewing two people who had spent uh, 15 years on Robben Island, and they were part of the same uh, cell. Um, and both of them remembered completely differently about how they were busted and what was the evidence. You know, and, and it, just, it just rocked my sensibility that 15 years was taken out of your life and you couldn't remember or you remembered differently what actually happened. Uh, you know, something as serious as that. And, and so it's instructive to us that we're doing this oral histories, but how careful we have to be in sifting through uh, the sort of stories that people think. You know, Pasolini writes about this, you know, saying that even people, uh, given a new political climate, like, uh, you know, he was looking at uh, strikers in Turin in the 1930s, in a new political climate, most of them had ironed out uh, any sense of the violence of the strike. So you, you talk to people now who are part of the negotiated agreement and so on. They almost write out any part of the violent parts of the struggle. You know, and, and you have to really be very careful in, in trying to interview people uh, in ways um, that, that cover your bases in a way. Um, but, but I agree with Johnny, you know, they, they speak for themselves. Uh, you know, warts and all. So I hate this thing that SIC that people put as if you now have to be politically correct. Oh, I disagree with this here, but SIC, they're sick or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's just ridiculous. You can't write like that. It's, 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 um, uh, but 
the Robben Island thing, you know, I just think that there's so many questions I didn't ask. These were young men, you know, in a place for 10, 15, 20 years, right? I mean, what, 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 they, what were they doing about sex? Were they masturbating? You know what I mean? If they were masturbating, who, who were they thinking about when they masturbated? I mean, these are big things. It's almost like nobody's written about, like, sex and Robben Island, as if, you know, these men were, you know, I don't know what they were. You know, I was almost going to say they're all Catholic priests, and I realized that Catholic priests always think about sex. But, so, it was a, you know, that, was, that wasn't a good... But the other part of this is how, how do you deal with the haunting thing that a lot of these people came out, and we regarded them as the... They had all this cultural, political capital. And they were actually, because they, the longer you spent in the jail, the greater a genius you were. This is what our struggle is reduced to. And, and, and yet a guy came out, and he writes in his own biography, you know, in, he released in 1989. He's going to go into parliament, into cabinet. He's going to make macroeconomic policy. And yet they had got to Joburg, and uh, they weren't going to be released because the document was forgotten. And then a document just arrived. And it was the first time he realized what is a fax machine. He had never seen a mobile phone uh, yeah. in his life. Not his fault. So these are very old. Because I transpose that into saying, when we went to receive these guys at the Soweto rally, we just want to hear wisdom and political direction. But they go in in 1964. They come out in 1989. The world has changed fundamentally. And maybe they haven't. Well, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you both for your gracious responses to my questions. Uh, we have about five to ten minutes for a few questions uh, from, from the audience. So I know there are two roving mics uh, around. So if you have any questions, if you could just indicate, and then we'll take uh, all questions sort of at once and give the speakers an opportunity to respond. And then after that, we'll have to wrap up. There's a question in the front here. Anybody else? Thank you. Um, Gayatri Spivak in Can the Subaltern Speaks, um, Can the Subaltern Speak, talks about um, the uh, practice of sati in India, you know, the burning of the woman on the husband's funeral pyre, and um, talks about the paralysis that one feels I, when, when um, writing the other. So she says, on the one hand, you have the, um, uh, the liberals who say, we can't outlaw the practice because it's um, the British wants to outlaw the practice, and therefore it's a case of white women saving brown women from brown men. And on the other hand, we have the, the nationalists who say it's part of our culture, the women want to die. And somehow you sense this paralysis when writing the other, when speaking for the other, when wanting to engage the other, you want to be so politically correct that you, you somehow lose the ability to act. So I'm just wanting to get some thoughts okay. from the writers about that. Thanks, thank you very much. For that. Can I, we have another question up there? I can't see. <laughs> she didn't take another question. She, well, I have another question, yes. but... Um, Shall I just ask you my... Uh, is there another question from the audience? No? No, okay. Well, I have one last question. Oh, there's one? Oh, thank you. There's one up there. Sorry, I can't see. Wow. Yeah, it's hard to look up there. <laughs> it's really tough. Come with glasses. Hi. Hi, this is to, to, to Ashwin. Ashwin, when you, when you raise the concept of sort of evolutionary memories or uh, evolving memories in a sense which speak about individual consciousness and memories that change. Does that not translate into our history, for example, as it's being rewritten by the dominant forces? For example, uh, the PAC and POCO is being written out of history. Robert Sabukwe is being written out of history. And one has to then question, is the collective consciousness at work Consciously, or is it at work unconsciously? Because we see our history is changing in a way whereby we sanitized the dominant forces. We don't talk about 
uh, the APLA members that were killed, for example, by the ANC. We don't talk about the APLA members who are languishing in prison. We sort of whitewashing our history, and in 10 or 15 or 20 years' time, there will be a different history as opposed to the truth. Just well, let me start with the first, uh, the first question. Um, well, well, let me, I mean, forgive me, but let me, let me respond with a, a short a story uh, about this man, Asad Abdullah, who I was reading about. I mean, he discovered genital, uh, female genital mutilation or circumcision, or I mean, the great controversy about what to call it, by having sex with his wife for the first time, and, and discovered um, that the process of opening her vagina was one of the most traumatic things he'd ever experienced. Um, he knew very little firsthand about it before. And, and he became militantly against the practice um, and thought that it was barbaric. And, I mean, he's now had two wives, and they're both militantly for it um, and, and absolutely insist that it was right, that it happened to them and that it happened to their daughters. Um, and, it's, and it's enormous conflict between him and, and, and both of his wives. I mean, he had the wives sequentially. Um, and his second wife has finally given birth to a daughter, and he's absolutely insisted, you know, it's a, it's a deal breaker for him. There will be no circumcision. Uh, he, he's, he's absolutely adamant. But perhaps the moral of that story is that, is that change probably does have to come from the inside. Uh, I, I think that that how a culture relates to its own practices is complicated. Um, and, and who the victim is is quite complicated and, and what people feel about these practices. I, I think that, that swooping in from on high and um, just by fiat declaring something can no longer happen generally backfires, it goes underground. Um, it, it, it really is something that's, that has to happen inside and outside together at the same time. Yeah, you know, just on the, firstly on the history question, um, you know, this is a wonderful thing from, you know, unknown Polish wit who said, you know, we don't know what our past is going to be. Um, and, and, bro, why worry about APLA and PAC? These guys have written in Becky out of history. He doesn't exist anymore. I was driving with a big ANC guy from Johannesburg, huge ANC guy. He's in the presidency. And they were going to do the 100 year history of the ANC, the official history. And uh, the, first, the second part was going to be done by him and the first part by Paolo Jordan. Of course, they never got it together. And I said, how are you going to, because he had been an opponent of Mbeki, how are you going to do uh, the Mbeki part? Like, he said to me, no, he doesn't regard the Mbeki period as part of real ANC history, so they're just going to write it out. <laughs> now, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, debate with people like that. As you know, you know Trotsky's book on, you know, uh, on the falsification of history and the airbrushing. Even in my family, because of my own controversy, I always stand at the edge of the photograph so they can airbrush me out. And, you know, you know, you know, so uh, don't, don't cut yourself up on it because uh, these guys are you know, uh, also writing their own, own people out. Um, on this, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't torture myself about who writes for whom. You know? And this can the subaltern speak? I'm just wondering, I mean, I just wish I could understand Spivak myself, forget the subaltern reading her. You know, I mean, this this post-colonial, language and stuff, you know, really needs to be ridiculed uh, in the way people are talking. I've been to conferences and so on. You know, they think the more jargon they throw, the more words they throw, the more convoluted it is, the closer they are to some kind of magic. But leave alone, you know, truth. But what I want to talk about is truth telling in this sense about insiders and outsiders. Sometimes it takes an outsider to tell it. Like in the Indian community, in this community, they'll never produce a novel. Because as soon as you write something about uh, uh, gay people, they say, oh, he must be gay. Like, oh, his father was gay. <laughs> you know, and uh, as soon, you know, soon as you write something, divorce, oh, no, nah, his mother got divorced. Like, so the only novel they can write is a nice Hindi girl, meet white fella, mother-in-law didn't like her, and then, and then she's baby came, all got happy ever after. That's all the stupid narratives they can write. Because... Talk about it. And like, yeah, we have gay people, we have sodomists, we have rapists, we have abusers. You'll never guess that if you write this, if you, read, if you come and listen to what the Indian community says about itself. 
is really going to, you know, I always say to people, like, you know, we go and watch this movie, East is East, bend it like Beckham. Like, I mean, this, this Indian community is very fascinating. They need a movie called Send It Like Chutia. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your responses. We, uh, we have another question. One, one more question. There's one question. One more. Ah, at the back. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is, in a strange way, is kind of answered by Ashwin. Yeah. Yeah, just what you said now. But 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 still, it's, it's for the guy on the left. I forgot his name. Johnny. Johnny. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. Johnny, um, I guess it's for you. Um, I'm trying to make sense about this 7,000 that you pay in order to get the story, and, and, and it's a white guy and, 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 and talking to a black guy. And, 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 and I'm trying to see how you navigate this power relation thing that goes on there. And, and, and I'm trying to imagine myself, you know, getting a story about white people, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to see how far, how far I can get, you know. All right, thank you. I hope you get what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's fairly clear. Be before you sort of go there, I'd like to also invite you both to maybe make some concluding remarks, because I think we've come to the end of our session in response to that question also. And I'd maybe also want you to maybe respond to, because you, you've rightfully said, Ashwin, the issue of the other is, is so kind of binary. And both of you have uh, brought out in, in your text this idea of the commodification of the self. In, in your, your book, uh, uh, Johnny, there's this one person, I think it's Rufus, who goes, I am the brand. You have to be a brand to be able to walk through the doors. So there's a sense in which agency is inverting that othering. It's pushing back against it. Um, and, and similarly for you, it's kind of, uh, Ashwin, the, the sort of self-silencing or, or the reanimation of the history of the incarcerated. You know, it's kind of rewriting history in a very deliberate way, even if it's fantastical. So maybe if you can wrap up your concluding remarks around that as well, that would be great. Sure. Well, I'll just conclude by answering the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean that <laughs> You know, what I do is I take a big chunk out of a person's life, a lot of time, hour, you know, countless hours, and, and I put something very, very intimate about them on a page, which many people are going to read. And uh, the book makes some money. You know, I get an advance, I get royalties. And there has to be a reciprocity between me and the person who shares their life with me to be on the page. They, they can't not be. And, and maybe monetizing that reciprocity is imperfect. I mean, it absolutely is. Um, but, it's, but it's really the only way I know how to activate that reciprocity. If, if, if I were to take all that time out of that person's life um, and share so much intimate stuff about them without sharing anything with them, uh, I mean, I think that would be the greater evil. Um, I would be very, very uncomfortable doing that. I think it would be wrong. I, I couldn't. Um, so yes, I'm, I mean, as I said right at the beginning, it's, it's, I, I don't think there's a perfect ethical solution. Um, you know, I think offering a person in need money to share something has its problems. Um, I mean, I think what I did is, is, is the best that one probably could do in that situation. Incidentally, it's, it's, it's interesting that you call him black, the for those of you who read the book when it comes out next year, the politics of being Somali are very interesting. Um, and he bolted the idea of being black. Uh, but that's, that's another story for another time. Thank you. I think, I think firstly, I mean, just writing the Shakespeare book changed my life in, in, in many ways because um, I think that people write these strident critiques of South Africa, they're pretty good, but often it's abstracted from the history of our struggles. Um, and in talking to people, I, I really learned a lot, and I was very humbled. It didn't stop me being critical, but it humbled me about how, what has gone in our history, what has shaped the ideas of people uh, who spent so long in prison. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it really changed me in a lot of ways, and, and uh, it still fascinates me um, that those histories have been written out. When I ask South Africans uh, about people on Robben Island, 
uh, and I asked them, many people were not in the single cells, which was only 35 people, but the hundreds, as you know, in the general section. Very few people can tell me, tell, give me two or three names of people in the general section because, as the person was saying, the history has now become part of those mythical histories around those single cells, and the conditions were very different. But just to say about just and, and that kind of answer, I mean, also doing research is a messy business. It's not easy, and you've got to be a bit quick on your feet. And I'm just going to end with the story. I mean, I uh, was interviewing uh, Kwedi in Kalipi, who spent 20 years on Robben Island, PAC guy, uh, quite a fantastic man. And I met him in the APLA Veterans Mowbray office. And uh, it was just going to be a very small interview because he had chosen something from Macbeth, all the perfumes in Arabia. And I just want to ask you why he chose that. And basically, his answer was that they were trying to release him early to the to Transkai, but he wouldn't take it because, you know, it was the smell of apartheid. But as I was just interviewing him, people were coming to the office, old men who had participated in the, in the PAC marches of the early 60s, and they were paying incredible homage to me. They were coming from Google to Anlanga all the way to Mowbray. And I, I was, like, really getting worried about what was happening here. So eventually it turns that the mythical leader this great leader that people loved of the PAC in, 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 in Cape Town was Barney Desai. And they thought Barney Desai's son had come to rescue the history of the PAC. And they were, you know, you know so I, I must admit at that time didn't disabuse them of the idea. <laughs> well, Thank you both very much for your frankness and your honesty. Writing the other, Ashlyn and Jonathan.